Hello, everyone, and welcome to Homemakers Radio. I'm honored that you chose me to listen to while you walk or while you work. I hope to speak to you a little bit today about walking, and I'm going to be reading from a McGuffey reader and a Jane Austen diet, the Jane Austen diet, and uh, don't be frightened. It's really not about a diet. It won't hurt. <laughs> and so uh, I have a few things to say before I get before I begin, and I want to really guard my the quality of my voice, so some of the things I will save for afterwards. But if you're not dressed yet, please go and do that, and do your absolute very best. Try to look nice. Try to be more than you have to be, and just do a little bit more pretty than necessary, and then go for your walk out there before breakfast and don't just do it mechanically. Don't write it on your list and say, okay, I went for my walk. This is ruining people, you know. They're exercising and they're checking everything off and uh, they do all kinds of things, but they don't do it with a, with a heart or with a mindful spirit or to build the inner person or to preserve the mind. And so everything we do has to be done with our spiritual advantage and with a with something in mind other than the physical um, progress that we're making and other than and this is what this book the Jane Austen diet is all about that it has to be more than that so when you go on your walk and I've just come in from my walk before breakfast and haven't even had a chance to uh, comb my hair but I have discovered something that you might have discovered yourself. If you'll walk with a perf- purposeful mind, it, with mindfulness, looking at everything, listening to everything, feeling everything, and thinking, you're going to find that it will provide for you a mental detox, plus fill your mind with so many ideas you have to quit and go in because... Uh, there's just so much you have to calm yourself down after a while so it'll give you something besides adrenaline to run on so take a little notebook with you you might get some ideas and or you know how to do things better at home or how to make life uh, more comfortable and happy and so I'm going to start out now with the eclectic third reader which I've been on because I discovered a delightful chapter in it now my children had these books but with books because I was a homeschooler and I realized it's not good to push people into curriculums and have them have them do this uh, rote learning that is so mechanical I just wanted them to learn about life and if there was books like this I'd leave them on a table or a coffee table and maybe read them one sentence of it and then put it down and uh, then they would pick it up and come to me and say well this is what else it says and start a discussion so and and you have to learn to look at life a little bit differently than what you did in public school because public school is a military system where everyone learns the same thing Uh, you're all the same age I've got a granddaughter who's going to be 15 on December 25 and she's so excited and her family's so excited for her and I am too but when I was going to be 15 I was in a class full of other 15 year olds boys and girls and it wasn't so special as it is when you're the only 15 year old in your family and so people will mock the homeschooler especially the big families they'll mock them and say you know how can one mother teach Uh, six children seven children or more Uh, but they have no qualms about having a teacher with uh, 28 people in a classroom (laughs) all the same age whereas with a homeschooler not everyone's going to be the same age there's going to be the little little ones and then there's going to be the 15 year old who's excited about her birthday and then they're going to be the older ones who have already been 15 and they're excited for her and just the whole dynamic is so different and the learning is wonderful because all these different age groups interact and learn from one another so now because I'm elderly you kids can learn from me and we can just pretend you know that we're in one of these families with the multi-generational age group (laughs) 
So I'm going to read something that just seemed like a treasure and it's lesson uh, 40. <laughs> you have to, no, 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 it's lesson 60. You have to know Roman numerals to get this figured out uh, if you're going to use these. So here's the rule. Remember at the beginning of every lesson there's a rule. And I love the rule because the rule provides you a lesson for several weeks because you can you can absorb it and talk about it. And that's one of the beauties of home schools. You don't have to be in a hurry. You can just absorb what you read and then pretty soon you'll at first you'll find yourself feeling rather slow and unable to grasp things. But after a while you'll start doing leaps and bounds ahead of me. So, the importance of well-spent youth. <laughs> Don't feel bad. I think we all feel bad. We just want to go and do it again. But you know what? We can do it. So we'll just follow what's in here and we'll just do it. And then we'll have a well-spent youth, okay? <laughs> so rule. It is a bad excuse for an error to say, I had forgotten. Therefore, in this lesson, bear in mind the preceding rules. Now, this I have forgotten has become a big excuse and we have to learn to remember some I mean there there are uh, times when that's adequate and we all forget things but I think that there are important things that we need to remember so let's read the first paragraph as the beauty of summer the fruitfulness of autumn and the support of winter depend upon spring okay so the beauty of summer and the fruitfulness of autumn and the support of winter depend upon spring. I think you'd probably have to sit down and map that all out on paper as to what time you plant seeds and how important that spring is and how it uh, supports the summer, the autumn, and the winter. That would be quite a task. I have not done it myself, but you might. Uh, so they're comparing. As the beauty of summer, the fruitfulness of autumn, and the support of winter depend upon the spring, so the happiness, wisdom, and piety of middle life and old age depend upon youth. That's why that's why the uh, state wants your children because they're going. They know that they can program them to think a certain way and to be useful to their plans, and and. Uh, it's very important for them to get them away from the family. So now that I've got you, you'll be doing what I tell you. <laughs> so, so the happiness, wisdom, and piety of middle life and old age depend on youth. Youth is the seed time of life. If only the parents in the 40s and 50s and 30s had remembered that, had known that, but we trust they trusted the school system to take care of us and to give us the things, the tools that we needed to get along in life, and it was not very good. So I know that there's a lot of people that just love the 1950s, and I was a 1950s child, um, but I can't glorify it all the time. I love some things about it, but there were some, having lived in it, I just have to tell you that uh, there were some things to be desired of that era. It was actually quite a difficult time. So if the farmer does not plow his land and commit the precious seed to the ground in spring, it will be too late afterwards. So if we, while young, neglect to cultivate our hearts and minds by not sowing the seeds of knowledge and virtue, our future lives will be ignorant, vicious, and wretched. Okay, so then they quote a proverb, the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. He therefore shall beg and harvest and have nothing. Well, that's worth uh, discussing. So if you've got this book, that might be some, uh, a paragraph that you might want to write out. Uh, maybe I can uh, put it on the post for you and you can write it out in your, in your common book. And this is so important. If the farmer does not plow his land and commit the precious seed to the ground in spring, it will be too late afterwards. So if we, while young, neglect to cultivate our hearts and minds by not sowing the seeds of knowledge and virtue, our future lives will be ignorant, vicious, and wretched. Now, what is the knowledge and virtue that it speaks of? And that is how to be polite, 
how to be decent, how to be clean, how to be thoughtful, uh, how to look for, look out for danger, how to be alert for uh, learning and for opportunities. Those are all things people will say, young man, you should, or young woman, you should commit yourself to wisdom and knowledge, but they don't tell you what it is. So you need to define that. What kind of wisdom and what kind of knowledge? Because there's good knowledge and bad knowledge, and there's uh, good wisdom and there's foolish wisdom. You know, I mean, people will pretend to be wise, and they'll tell you something, and it just won't make sense at all. So let's remember that it means knowing how to and also when to say something and when not to what to say and what not to it doesn't have to be anything in particular just a general thing you know don't say things that hurt people's feelings don't insult someone's property or house or country uh, be careful about uh, jumping onto what someone says and being constantly negative and um, contradictory. I wanted to, and there are many more really good paragraphs in here, but I want to get on with this other book and we will finish this another time. Uh, but I wanted to, there's so, it's so packed with uh, thought that I can't just read it all to you. I will put the paragraph in there and you see what you can do with it. But we have to define what knowledge and what wisdom we want to have in our hearts to prepare us for later years. So, um, so we, some of you who are older, you can start over. You can be a youth and you can accept my training. Okay, so I want to read from Brian Kozlowski's uh, The Jane Austen Diet. And I'm really enjoying it better reading it aloud because it's hard for me to concentrate for some reason uh, on on reading, on steady reading, as Mrs. Uh, Hamley told Molly in Wives and Daughters. I'm, I don't do much steady reading. <laughs> Molly said that to her, I think. Okay, this is all about eating. This is the chapter on uh, our devouring plan. And like I said yesterday, I want to name my dining room the uh, devouring room reminds me somewhat of the clampets uh, what did they call it was it the big eating room or something like that what did they call their dining room uh, I thought that was interesting so readers today tend to forget how progressive Jane's eating encouragements were for the time I want to just stop briefly and talk about how uh, the Austin books were not generally considered great or classic and uh, I think it was people themselves that enjoyed them I mean we, we have brought them out into the public more but they were not considered you know as in the line of classics but um, just by sheer volume of how people use them and purchase them and read them and uh, put them into movies, they have been made into classics. Regency fashions promoted exactly the opposite. So I'll just start over here. Readers today tend to forget how progressive Jane's eating encouragements were for the time. Regency fashions promoted exactly the opposite, labeling eating itself as somehow an indelicate, unwomanly thing to do. A woman should never be seen eating or drinking, said Lord Byron in 1812, insisting that if she must eat, what a thought, it should be something inherently feminine and becoming. Try finding that label in the supermarket. It was one of the first cultural fads that Jane ridiculed with biting wit in love and friendship. I've never read that one. A short story written in her teens. Never, never will I so demean myself, says one of the stupider characters, <laughs> with the mean and indelicate em employment of eating and drinking. That Jane laughed at this idea so early on only proves how accurately she understood her main subject, love. A realistic love life, in fact, demands a realistic relationship with food. Scientists first discovered the connection in the 1940s in one of the first experiments into calorie restriction. 
they found that the more people dieted, meaning eating only minimal amounts of food, the less romantically inclined they felt. Though the test subjects were all young and healthy, the joys of falling in love become too much trouble when they weren't getting enough to eat. Instead, food became their new passion. The only thing they could think, uh, think, talk, and observe, obsess over. That Jane's heroines don't do this, that they spend more time thinking about love and not about food, is actually the best evidence, evidence that they aren't dieting in the traditional sense. Because whatever people might think, Jane told her sister in 1813, an empty stomach is not the most favorable for love. I wonder if that was the era where they had this, de developed the saying, um, uh, uh, a man's heart is through his stomach or something like that. I can't even remember what it was. Harmonized by distance. If distance makes the heart grow fonder in Austin world, it also makes for much healthier eating habits. That is, there's a reason why food is only brought out during specific mealtimes in Jane's novels and almost exclusively enjoyed in the boundaries of the dining parlor. The image of Lizzie slumping into the kitchen and snatching a pork pie snack is such an un Austin thought. Mrs. Bennett is positively rankled by the idea. She assured him with some asperity that her daughters had nothing to do in the kitchen. The idea was pervasive during the Regency era. It wasn't deemed proper, polite, or civilized for gentlefolks to be constantly surrounded by the sights, smells, or sounds of food. That is a very, very good point for us today. We don't need to be around the scent of food all the time. And that's why your early morning walk is so important because you're going to smell, hopefully, smell something different than food. And the olfactory nerves are created to work together with the, with the uh, appetite and with the stomach and with digestion. They're all part of it. And that's why uh, it's so important to prepare your own food because you get to sense it, uh, smell it, and enjoy uh, cooking it. And all those things go together to prepare the appetite. And that's when the smells come in and, and the children start coming in so, for a uh, bit of raw celery or something that you're peeling. And... Uh, so it's so important not to be constantly surrounded by the stimulation of food smells. And unfortunately, we are, aren't we? You can hardly go anywhere without smelling it. Because whatever people might think, Jane told her sister in 1813, an empty stomach is not the most favorable for love. So, if distance makes the heart grow fonder in Austin world, it also makes for much healthier eating habits. That is, there's a reason why food is only brought out during specific mealtimes in Jane's novels and almost exclusively enjoyed in the bound boundaries of the dining parlor. Uh, so then Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Bennett is uh, totally rankled by the idea of any of the girls being into the kitchen and snack uh, snacking. Regency kitchens were thus placed as far as physically possible from everyday living quarters. We went on a tour one time of an old southern mansion, and I believe it was in Louisiana, and we noticed that the kitchen was such a long way from all the other quarters, the living quarters and all the, and the sleeping quarters and, and the library and everything else. It was just totally far away. And food had to be brought to the from the kitchen to the dining area where it was taken. So I suppose they was it would have been a lot like us when we were younger. We'd go out in the garden and graze if we needed a snack. One real life Pemberley estate, Kedliston Hall in Derbyshire, even managed to distance its kitchen over 65 yards from its dining room, more than half the size of a football field. That's not what that mansion was like that we went to. It was from the uh, 1800s. 
And while honesty forbids categorizing this as anything but pure Regency snobbery, footmen don't get paid for nothing, silly. <laughs> it must be said that setting up these physical barriers to food practically eliminated mindless eating. Well, you know, you'd have to hire somebody to fetch the food and bring it to you, but I suppose that was all part of the way that the uh, economy worked. Uh, and I think it probably would be healthier than working at a fast food restaurant. Who can brainlessly binge when a trip to the pantry involves a mini trial thon? <laughs> the modern contrasts, of course, are striking open concept home designs have practically plopped kitchens into our living rooms. Yes, we all have these open kitchens now but I think it kind of harkens back to the uh, to the cottage where it was just one room anyway. Or, you know, growing up in Alaska, there were a lot of these cabins that were just one room. And the kitchen would be over on one wall, and there'd be a table, and then over somewhere else there'd be a, a bed or a couch, and it was all in one room. It was pretty hard to escape. I guess it would depend on um, your economic level. So, open concept home designs have practically plopped kitchens into our living rooms where everyone's refrigerator now an effortly sock slide away. <laughs> Today, to find yourself on the wrong end of a ravishing ice cream craving is to open the freezer with one finger. And needless to say, all this modern convenience has made for a world where food is more accessible more thoughtfully, thoughtlessly tempting than ever, where we can all too easily stare into those empty cartons of Rocky Road double fudge remorse and wonder how they got into our laps in the first place. Let's face it, we all desperately need a bit of Regency-style distance between us and our food. And, as science is observing, we don't need a Kedliston Hall or a cow to do it. I still have some things in the garden. There's some. I know there's some potatoes there and... Uh, I just get ready to fix a meal and think, oh, must I go out to the garden? But what is the difference between having to go do that and poke around in the dirt to find a potato and then come in and wash it or wash it outside first and and then or getting in the car and running down to Safeway or wherever you get your grocery store, grocery food. Uh, that's just as exhausting, but we don't notice it as much uh, because of the cushy car ride, but it takes a lot of time and um, I remember when a, a hotel had a you could get a meal at a hotel but the hotel's food came from the hotel garden and even today when you go look at the historical hotels you can see they where they had a garden that provided their food and I think there were uh, some restrictions made about it in recent decades due to the fact that there were certain companies that wanted their food purchased by these hotels uh, from the grocery stores or from delivery and so in some respects you weren't allowed to grow your hotel food in your garden which I think is a shame. Researchers at the University of Illinois have discovered that even small distances and tiny obstacles tend to be incredibly effective at halting mindless snacking. In a study involving a container of chocolate candy and how far people had to go to reach it, participants found themselves munching far more frequently when the container was placed at an easy arm's reach than when the same container was moved mere feet away. Unbelievably, the physical drag of getting up and walking a few steps was enough of an obstacle to drastically minimize thoughtless eating. You know, when we were kids, we liked to read. That was our our form of uh, relaxation, escape, and entertainment was reading. And we'd get into a good book and get up and sit in our beds and read uh, because we were from a big family and that was the seat that we had that was our own. So we'd read there. And even if our stomach was growling and we were having hunger pangs, we would not leave that book and go down and try to find something to eat because the story was uh, 
more engrossing. It all comes down to, as Austin would say, a great deal of indolence. People naturally don't like to work too hard at procuring food, especially when they're not that hungry in the first place. It's a great reminder for embracing your inner regency laziness to become a rational, though languid, eater, naturally unwilling to traverse the curvy corridors of your own Cadliston Hall. Translating that into the 21st century starts by limiting the number of convenience foods at home. They make eating a little too convenient. And if you find yourself reaching for that carton of ice cream, don't reach for the freezer. Instead, create a Regency-style barrier. Drive, or better yet, walk down to your local ice cream parlor for a single serving. We did that uh, for a couple of years when the children were older. We said, we're not going to keep a gallon of ice cream in the freezer anymore. We're going to go down to Dairy Queen and get a cone and uh, eat it on the way home. Um, it's just too easy, isn't it, to, uh, to overdo it. Translating that into the 21st century starts by limiting the number of convenience foods at home. They make eating a little too convenient. I mentioned to you last time that I had an ice cream recipe. It's so much trouble <laughs> that, you know, you think when food starts becoming less convenient, you think oh, the thought of it, of, you know, getting it all out and the work of putting it together and making it. And uh, my thought comes to me, oh, do we have to eat at all? <laughs> It's discouraging. They make eating a little too convenient. And if you find yourself reaching for that carton of ice cream, don't reach for the freezer. Instead, create a Regency-style barrier. Drive or walk down to your local ice cream parlor for a single serving. Then again, you'll probably think twice about the whole expedition, exhaling along with Austin. I have not the heart for it. The Western world now enjoys access to the cheapest, most abundant food on the planet. With one sobering irony, all that expensive, inexpensive abundance makes it hard to properly enjoy it. As supermarkets brim with cheap food in bulging bags and plastic packages, it's difficult not to buy into the general illusion to treat food as cheaply as it costs. That's an interesting concept that the more abundant something is and the more cheap it is, the less we value it. Whereas if you're pulling up your first uh, carrot out of the garden, you get rather excited. You want, you want a prize for growing it. And then you want to cut it up into tiny pieces and let everybody sample it and, and make noises about how great it is. Um, I don't think we would do that with commercial food, would we? you know, the stuff you get at the grocery store. By the time it's sold to you, it seems like it has lost its flavor. Oddly enough, Regency well-to-dos had a very similar problem. Yeah, I suppose they had more access to food and they took it for granted. Compared to revolutionary France, food was fantastically abundant in early 19th century England. Cartoons of the era glorified it, depicting rotund English diners devouring mountainous buffets of food, gigantic roast beefs, immoderately large puddings, and fishbowl-sized pints of beer, while their silly French neighbors fought over a single frog to sauté. He's so salty, isn't he? And no one pigged out on Britain's edible bounty more than the era's overeater, George the Fourth, the Prince Regent. Now, was he the George? The, see, sometimes there was a king over Scotland that was the third one or something, while it was the fifth one over England, and it was the same guy. I've never figured that one out. Usually depicted with satirical beach ball proportions, George liked his dinners like he liked his mistresses. <laughs> they were gorging extravaganzas, the dinners, four-hour four marathons of continuous feasting on dozens of main dishes and desserts. It seemed to be the fate of all prosperous cultures, regardless of century. To be surrounded by a land of edible plenty is to instinctively begin to overeat, 
it's only natural. Rather, it's the unnatural consequences of separating ourselves from nature itself, from where our food comes from and the real cost of eating it. Now, I can remember growing up uh, on the homestead in the wilderness in Alaska, how the food was kept in a cellar. And then mother had uh, things that she had canned, but it was kept off into uh, a side room, not even connected to the kitchen. You had to go a ways to get it. And uh, we weren't certainly weren't grazing it, but also there was the garden. If you, we, we were allowed to graze in the garden, we, but you had to go out there and get it, and then you had to wash it, and sometimes not worth the trouble. So, so to be surrounded by a land of edible plenty is to instinctively begin to overeat. It's only natural. Rather, it's the unnatural consequences of separating ourselves from nature itself, from where our food comes from, and the real cost of eating it. Mm. Jane Austen experienced a much closer connection. She grew up on a farm in Hampshire that was practically self-supporting. She knew the immense work involved in coaxing the earth to produce something edible, but she also knew the joys. Her letters are full of the little excitements of kitchen gardening, finding the first apricot in the orchard, turning the last summer berries into jam. Read them carefully, and Austen's novels become an enchanting hymn to England's agricultural heritage. There is a book of Jane Austen's letters you can get online. I may have it somewhere. I'm not sure. Read them carefully, and Austen's novels become an enchanting hymn to England's agricultural heritage, particularly expressed in Emma. Who can forget the superior pork raised light on the Hartfield estate, or the ripening strawberries and the wholesome apples? And even in the movie, the 1995 thing, edition, I think, Miramax, uh, there was sure a lot of fresh food in scenes. Uh, the apples, the strawberries, the uh, the basket full of uh, things taken taken to a, a poor neighbor. Uh, food was highly uh, a, a big subject in Jane Austen's novels. Or the wholesome apples that come directly from Mr. Knightley's farm, a farm that inspires one of the rarest uh, narratorial rhapsodies of all Austen fiction. At the bottom of this bank, favorably placed and sheltered, rose the Abbey Mill Farm, with meadows in front and the river making a close and handsome curve around it. It was a sweet view, sweet to the eye and to the mind. English verdure, English culture, English comfort, seen under a sunbright. I don't know if we would have called it a bank. We probably would have called it a berm. <laughs> For Jane to feel inseparably connected with food's earthy roots is to naturally ensure a healthy respect for it. Overeating proves difficult when you understand the meaningful struggle behind the meal. Years ago, there was a lady named Stormy Ormation who wrote a book called um, Greater Health God's Way, and she had a chapter on food and how if you went to the grocery store, she said, you would just run your cart up and down the aisles and then fill it up and then buy it and come home. And she said, but if you had it in the garden, you had to go out there and you had to tend the garden and you had to also dig the food up or pick it. Then you had to bring it in and you had to pare it, you know, peel it or and chop it. And then you had to cook it and, you know, you had to watch everything and make sure you're... you're uh, labor didn't go to waste. You had to tend your garden, weed it, look at it, water it. And she talked about how much more energy was used to take care of your own food than to go and get it yourself. I disagree. I always found grocery shopping exhausting. But she claimed, uh, which I think she had valid point, was that we would not have a weight problem if we had to get our food out of our gardens. Uh, because it's so much easier to put twice as much in your grocery cart than you would have ever grown. Uh, and if you look at what's in there, 
how long would it have taken you to create that food in your garden and, and the labor that you would have had to put into it? You start looking at it and, and figure that out. And then you can see why we're why we have a problem. For Jane, to feel inseparably connected with food's earthy roots is to naturally ensure a healthy respect for it. Overeating proves difficult when you understand the meaningful struggle behind the meal. And while we can't make the time leap back to the rolling farmlands of Regency England, we can still return to an Austin-esque appreciation of what we eat. We just need to recalibrate the basic food consciousness by remembering how precious food really is. Try visiting a local farmer's market, planting a vegetable garden, or baking something from scratch. Reacquaint yourself with the real cost of food, and you'll soon start respecting and reducing what winds up on your fork. I think it also has a lot to do with your health, because even if you ate starchy potatoes and mushy peas and uh, an apple pie from the stuff you grew at home, you would still be healthier with a lot less additives in those foods that you would get at the grocery store. You would still be healthier. And I think the reason a lot of people have to go to doctors and, and then they get on pharmaceuticals is a lot to do with that food. If you start to cleanse your body and just eat things in the closest to their natural form as possible, if you use the grocery store, you just shop the outer perimeters of it where all the fresh stuff is and uh, just get things uh, that you have to, if you can't get it fresh, get it, uh, and I believe it goes like this, fresh, then um, dried, and then bottled, and then canned, or something that's just the furthest away from its natural state. Dining in company, this is delightful. For novels, with more meal scenes and famous dinners than one can shake a fork at. Did you ever look up the history of the fork? It's so interesting and amusing because it looked like uh, before that there were just spoons or you ate with your hands and there were knives but no forks and I believe the French invented it. Um, so congratulations if you're French. Uh, you have a great heritage. But it was so frowned on when it first came out. I'm not sure who invented it, but the peasants quite liked it. And um, um, royalty didn't approve of it because it looked like a pitchfork. And they thought that it would make people uh, shovel food into the... They look like a shovel. I guess the spoon does too. Uh, that you would put food in your mouth at a much faster rate if you could, um, you know, put the fork in it and... Uh, You'll have to go and find out about it because there was an amusing story written on it years ago. A lot of things that I used to read on the web 20 years ago are, are no longer there. But that is an interesting story, the uh, invention of the fork. <clears throat> so... For novels with more meal scenes and famous dinners than one can shake a fork at, one thing happens with astonishing rarity. An Austin char character eating alone. Isn't that the truth? It only happens twice in Jane's novels, both times standing out like glaring anomalies. I would suggest if you're alone and you have to eat alone to make a ceremony of it. Do you remember reading about this uh, ambassador to some remote place um, some country had sent him to some remote place and there was no one there to eat with him so he set a, a table and he had his utensils and his plate and he served himself up properly and put a put a napkin in his collar and <laughs> ate properly anyway because he said I'm still a dignified human being Willoughby's rushed lunch for one near the end of Sense and Sensibility, for example, seems almost prolificate. Likewise, Mr. Weston's solitary dinner in Emma appears to unsettle the entire village. Note that he must satisfy inquiries that his lonely meal wasn't too unbearable. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? 
I, I hate to see you uh, eat alone. Won't you come and eat with us? Or could I bring something over and eat with you? Now, that used to be really a problem. We did not want people to have to eat their meals alone because when you grow up, you ate around a table. You had all that company and you... Um, we're sitting across from somebody. But I, I suppose nowadays, people don't like people very much, and they just really want to be left alone. <laughs> they don't like people uh, sitting across the table from them. <clears throat> Poor soul, modern readers tend to ignore these atypical details. They're so drastically different from what we love about Austin's novels. The social meals, the endless dinner invitations, the long tables, the lively conversations amidst all the lovely eating, drinking, and laughing together. We love it because most of us have temporarily lost it. Our relationship with food can now, we are told, be only two basic things. Food can either be fuel for those who eat to live, or food can be pleasure for those who live to eat. Notice both views will probably leave you eating alone. We don't think it matters, but Austin says it does. Mrs. Bennett brags about dining with four and twenty families for good reason. It's something other cultures and other countries still understand, that there's a built-in safety valve when we eat in company. Food becomes more than just fuel, more than just pleasure when we eat with others. Now my problem with eating with others, I have a lot of... Uh, tea tea type foods and serving tea to people. I had someone over on Thursday and then I had someone else wanted to come over on Friday and then Sunday someone else coming over that just wants to visit for a minute. Well, So I have the tea foods but the trouble with visiting is I'm not paying attention to what I'm eating. And this is one of the things that was written about in some of the ladies magazines in the 1960s was the fact that we're not paying attention to what we're putting in our mouth because we're having potlucks and we're having so much company and we're, and food is involved and we're not watching what we're eating. And when people started going to Weight Watchers, they started to become more conscious of what they were putting in their mouth when other people were around, when there was food around and when there was a celebration or a, or company. And... Uh, paying more they, they made you more conscious of it there was a book written about it and uh, it made you more conscious of what you were doing you could leave uh, there were all these stand-up type eating things where maybe you'd go to a an open house or something and there'd be food there but it would be standing up and people would bring you things on trays you wouldn't notice you wouldn't be conscious of what you were eating because you were talking, so you just reach over and grab something and put it in your mouth. And uh, the Weight Watchers, the, the early uh, original Weight Watchers, made you more aware of what you were doing. Um, so it says they're so drastically different from what we love about Austin's novels, the social meals, the endless dinner invitations, the long tables, the lively conversations amidst all that lovely eating, drinking, and laughing together. We love it because most of us have temporarily lost it. Our relationship with food can now, we are told, be only two basic things, food that is either fuel or food that's either pleasure. We don't think it matters, but Austin says it does. Mrs. Bennett brags about dining with four and twenty families for good reason. It's something other cultures and other countries still understand, that there's a built-in safety valve when we eat in company. Well, that was one of the uh, beauties of growing up in a big family is you couldn't be fat, you couldn't overeat, and there never were, I didn't even know what leftovers were till I married my husband, and he was only... Uh, there were only two in two children in his family, and there were uh, seven children in mine, and I didn't know what a leftover was. <laughs> and you could not get fat in a big family because uh, the meal had to go around. It was it was endlessly, and my mother tireless tirelessly put in a garden every year and preserved some of the food so that she could feed this big growing family. Uh, but you could never grow fat because of the competition. Food becomes more than just fuel, more than just pleasure when we eat with others. It becomes a binder for the relationships 
that matter most, especially to Jane, love, friendship, family, and community. It follows that large it follows that large quantities of food are never hoarded for solitary binges in Jane's novels. They are always shared amongst friends. When Mrs. Goddard and Emma, for instance, receives a sizable present of poultry, a beautiful goose, the finest goose Mrs. Goddard had ever seen, she immediately invites three teachers to sup with her, thereby eliminating the temptation for isolated overeating. This is one of the main reasons for why food is never something to be feared or forbidden in Austen's fiction. It simply isn't necessary. Food becomes less personal, sinful, or guilt-ridden the more it is communally divided. Hence, Jane's fondness for giving dining room occupancy numbers in her novels. It's 14 in the Bennett's case. That's how many chairs their dinner table can snugly accommodate. The more the merrier and the mentally healthier. Well, there is there is a good point there. Um, I, I wonder if with, with people around, maybe we're not going to eat so much because we want to visit. <laughs> He did not look tolerably upon a tolerably large eating room as one of the necessities of life. He's talking about, uh, I believe, Mr. Bennett. The further benefits of eating in company will be explored in the following chapter. For now, just remember that to eat alone in Austin world means to exclude something crucial from a meal. There's safety in numbers. Jane has so much more to say about food, and we'll get into specifics in subsequent chapters, but there's something we need to clarify before we close. According to Austin, there is nothing wrong, nothing unusual or unhealthy about truly enjoying food. That eating can be, and often is, very enjoyable is a fact repeatedly expressed in her personal letters. I always take care to provide such things as please my own appetite, she unabashedly wrote. Added is her adorably frank comment about apple pies being a considerable part of her domestic happiness. Jane wasn't interested in what she called self-mortification. Constant denials were, for her, as unhealthy as constant indulgences. What some call health, if purchased by perpetual anxiety about diet, isn't much better than tedious disease, a quote often attributed to one of Austin's favorite poets, Alexander Pope. And Jane echoes the sentiment exactly. Behold Mrs. Jennings' delightful mulberry memory in Sense and Sensibility. Delaford is a nice place, quite shut in with great garden walls that are covered with the best fruit trees in the country, and such a mulberry tree in one corner. How Charlotte and I did stuff the only time we were there. Food pleasure should never be a priority, but neither can pleasure be excluded from food, especially since pleasure appears to be a crucial puzzle piece to digesting it properly. First demonstrated in a now classic experiment from the 1970s, when participants in the study were given familiar foods they actually enjoyed, the rate of healthy iron absorption from the meal was 50% greater than when they were given foods that were less familiar and less appetizing. Pleasure seems to cue our bodies to metabolically, metabolically <laughs> make the best of things to take full advantage of food's nutritional offerings. Well, I've often said, if we eat in an atmosphere, and even the Bible talks about it, you know, it's better to eat uh, herbs in peace and quiet than, at a, you know, meat at a grand banquet table because you know the body will just automatically seize up when there's stress or trouble or impolite talk going on and you can't you can't digest but balance has always been the key so people have said the same thing slightly different for generations not too long ago in britain there was a wonderfully common saying that probably expressed it best a little of what you fancy does you good. Austin couldn't agree more. So next time, we're going to be reading this chapter here, Austin Eats Bread. Oh, are you frightened? <laughs> it is frightening, isn't it? Uh, to, to think of it, if you've, if you've gotten fat on it and you don't understand it. Um, so I want to discuss a couple more things before I go, and that is how important it is for you to be serene 
and happy and content. And this involves, this is why I say start out, and I wanted to share my teacup with you too. Doesn't that go nicely with this dress? I, someone gave me this teacup and I went to Hobby Lobby and bought the fabric for this dress and to go with it because I, oh, I was just so enchanted by it. So I'll show you the dress. And it's in one of the Laura Ashley patterns from the, I believe the 1980s. It has little uh, tucks up in the front. And one thing that I liked about these and using cotton is a grandmother, a mother, and a granddaughter could all wear the same style dress and the same print, and it was appropriate for every age group. When do you see that? Uh, that's one of the things I like about it was either the Laura Ashley patterns or the cottons that do it, but you could get three generations wearing the same style using the same pattern similar pattern and uh, they it was all appropriate all looked good the grandmother didn't feel too silly in it or too young and the and the child didn't feel too grandmotherly in it and uh, everybody it it just suited everyone and it was quite the trend in the 1980s to buy a Laura Ashley pattern that had the little girls pattern with it so I had I had made some of these for my family too so let's get back to um, some of the things that I had taken notes on and so the importance of your appearance even if you don't think anyone's going to see you anybody that's outside of your own family and your own comfort zone to get dressed up and fix yourself up and go for your stroll now during this stroll I have uh, started to observe some things you know you need to do a psychological study of yourself you take a little notebook with you and observe how your thoughts start to balance and get into order from a walk and how you and, and also there's other things uh, involved too and that is rest and sleep how important they are and how your your outdoor times affect your sleep and how sleep solves a lot of uh, tension and problems and anxiety because something that will bother you the day before and you're just it's just eating you up if you will sleep and then get up and go for a walk for some reason it just sort of uh, dissipates it's just like it dissolved and uh, and we, we certainly have a lot to be concerned about don't we um, so but I think the main thing is we need to be only concerned about what our family is their needs are and what we can do for them because we just cannot run the world we just cannot run the rest of the world but the home is the most important part of the world so let's get back to the idea that you can use anxiety as a way to uh, overcome and win when the anxiety feelings come come I don't really know that we are really that we're having anxiety, that people are having anxiety, because some of the descriptions of it is not, not what everyone feels, but it's a tension, you know, and it's a, it's a, something that absorbs your mind, but you could, if you could use it as a trigger, <laughs> everybody's triggered by something, uh, use it as a trigger to walk more serenely and to feel more content, and there's nothing wrong with being serene. There have been cultures all over the world that are known for their their serenity their demeanor their serenity so practice serenity and contentment for one day and so my daughter called me and we when we talk we um, try to solve problems and and mysteries and why things uh, you know and my son sons too will talk and we'll try to uh, solve something and so one of the things that she said I wrote it down and I thought that I would make a mandate for you to do this for one day. She said if every one of us homemakers would determine to be serene and content for one day, would would we not receive a, a blessing from God? And I believe too that we are sometimes denying ourselves great reward and great blessings because we're tied up in knots over something. So if you could why don't you just have a serene and content day just one day and then tomorrow you can worry again okay I, I don't want to take that away from you we're afraid if we don't 
if we don't have some tension and some worry and some anxiety that we will not be alert that we will just kind of go into a brain fog if we're not um, uh, taught and upset and um, concerned we're afraid of that we're afraid of going the other way into just kind of the lethargy or just letting things happen that we could probably uh, stop and so so that's why I say let's be serene and content for one day and then the next day you can go back to worrying so that's my mandate for one day I'm going to try to obey it myself too I'm really uh, one for if the people that you are teaching uh, you have to live what you want to teach them I'm going to try it myself and uh, so there were a couple of other things that I wanted them wanted people to realize first of all that you can use the anxiety as a trigger for living more serenely and contentedly but if you'll just try that to live serene and content for one day if you could plan a serene day <laughs> just plan one day and try to eliminate oh I know what it was I had read someone's blog and I couldn't tell you what it is right now but she had made a profound statement that most of us are afraid to make and she had said that as the for some reason she said she was because she tended to get depressed she was going to have to eliminate some things from her life uh, certain things certain activities uh, certain any any kind of thing that tended to bring on more stress for her and that she there were even going to be, have to be some people she wouldn't be allowed she, she wouldn't allow herself to be around because she needed to get a grip on this because um, because uh, talk that is depressing or talk that is discouraging could send her into this area of gloom and that is the one thing uh, that we that I'm noticing more that uh, people are not careful to be thoughtful of other people in what they're talking about and how debil debilitating that is and so what I've decided to do and you might try this too is limit what you say to people because a lot of people I have noticed and I've been a preacher's wife for 50 years and I've noticed that not everybody has ideas like you do not everybody has is full of stuff to talk about they haven't all read things they haven't all experienced anything they, they, they're not bubbling over with with things to talk about so what they do is they wait till you say something and then they dash it to pieces <laughs> because they really don't have anything to say and uh, so what I've had to do with if occasionally there'll be a person like that what I have to do is remember what they did last time we were together or last time they were here or I saw them in a social situation remember the things they said that were depressing and then try to curb my information flow to them so the next time they come I ask them how they are um, let them have a cup of tea and uh, just let them take the conversation but don't volunteer anything because the more I would say the more opportunity they would have to uh, cut it into pieces or knock it down it's somebody said once that a uh, I don't know what it was but you build a castle in the air and then somebody knocks it down <laughs> and uh, so you just have to be careful and young people need to know these little things about life these little wisdoms about uh, interacting with people in conversation so that they don't get discouraged too because they need to realize there are people that are just always going to be sour, dour, negative, gloomer, doomer, and so you have to realize how to how to overcome it. And one time, when I was about 20 years old, a lady in the church uh, took me with her to visit a couple of people that were shut-ins, and they're they're called shut-ins. Usually elderly, and usually uh, lived in a small place of their own, and uh, she wanted to make sure that the church ladies visited them often they weren't able to get out as much and probably infirm so when she uh, we stopped at this one place she said okay now before we go in uh, don't ask her how she is just tell her you're looking good today because this lady and of course I I thought I knew what I was doing and so I I felt like I needed to ask her and oh my goodness we just wasted about an hour about all of her infirmities which doesn't mean we uh, are not uh, sympathetic or we're not 
treating it as a Christian should, where you bear one another's burdens, you know, and you weep with those who weep. And uh, But there are some people that are just a little bit over the top with that. And so you have to be careful. And the one thing that she did that was so clever, she said, you have to say, um, it's so nice to see you or something like that. And you're looking good. You have a fresh bloom in your cheeks, something like that. And, uh, and it's true. It can be true, too. So, ladies, I've talked more than I intended to. And I want to get going here and uh, practice what I preach and go on my little stroll. And when you go on a stroll, you've got to be like a child. You've got to remember that little boy or little girl you held the hand of one time and how you took them out and they were looking around and they were probably seeing things you didn't see while you were thinking about what you were going to have to fix for lunch when you got back in the house. They were absorbing all this. So now let's go back to being a child. So that's another mandate. Go for your stroll today and be a child. Pick up a leaf. Look at things from a distance. Listen to the chatter of a squirrel and watch where it goes. This is very important for your mind. And these things have to be looked at and they have to be appreciated. So, ladies... Thank you for your prayers and thank you for your visit today and hope you got a few things done and I'll see you next time. Bye.